A merry-go-round is a pretty common piece of playground equipment, and that's kind of how it looks like. Uh, there's some children included for scale. In this case, we don't have multiple children on there, just to keep things simple. We're just going to have an empty one, and we'll kind of ignore all the bars and stuff, just to keep things simple. Just a nice, solid disc, or solid cylinder that we're assuming it is. So at the beginning, we just have, if you look from above, just a big old cylinder spinning around, what do they say, counterclockwise from above. And then we have one child called Jody right here running in the same direction. So she wants to get on, I guess. So she runs this way to jump on to the merry-go-round. And so she jumps on and the friction in her shoe or something, eventually the two of them the merry-go-round and the child travels together at the same spin rate. So in between, the only kind of torque that could happen is between the two of these objects, which would be called an internal force, right? Or internal torque. So therefore, we're very much encouraged to use angular momentum to solve this problem. In a sense, it's very similar to a collision because the only substantial force or torque is between the objects within the system, which we call an internal torque. There's no substantial, therefore, external torque. So that whole term goes to, goes away, and the calculation become easy. What is an added element here is that the child initially is not spinning. She's just running straight. So how do we incorporate that in our angular momentum? Well, as it turns out, the term of angular momentum actually has two parts. We'll only show you the first part so far in our previous example, and that's I omega, when the thing spins about itself. But if its center of mass is moving as well, there's an additional angular momentum term that involves this cross product, R being from the rotational axis to the object itself. Because it's cross product, let's do the perpendicular arm here. So the first term here refers to the rotation of the object about its center, and the second term deals with translation of the center relative to the axis. Right Again, we're separating the motion into rotation about the center and translation of the center. Right, We've done this many times, but in a sense, this part is actually the more fundamental bit. It's from this definition that we derive this simpler form where we do separate out the rotation and the translation. So let's collect our knowledge, I guess, and data into our table as usual. For the merry-go-round, the angular speed is 20 RPM to begin with. And we're wondering what it is afterwards. The initial running speed of the child is five meters per second. And then afterwards, I mean, we can, I'll show you how it relates in two ways, but we're going to treat the point mass, which is the child here, as continuing to have some tangential speed. But because of it rotates sitting on this thing, being R away, would have the same spin rate times r for her tangential speed. So let's do this bit by bit. Let's convert my RPM into radians per second. Because we do have to deal with the other term, which involves meters per second. So the initial angular momentum, everything's going to go in the same direction. Because as drawn, everything is going to be counterclockwise with respect to my axis. Right, we've just learned that angular momentum actually has two parts. But it doesn't actually negate what we've done before because in all those cases, the center of mass of the spinning object, like the merry-go-round in this case, is not moving. So that term goes away and we're left with our familiar I omega term. Now for the Chio, she definitely has a velocity, but we're going to say that she's kind of point-like. 
in the sense that her radius is about zero. So no matter what her shape is then, if her radius is zero, her moment of inertia will be basically zero. So a running point mass, all the angular momentum, comes from this second term, which is why we can't ignore it in this case. For the merry-go-round, even though it's a very flat disk, it is still a solid cylinder, even though the height is very small, right around here like that. So we are still looking at a solid cylinder about its axis, right? It's just a very thin slice of such things. So still one half mr square, right? Choosing the right shape and the right axis. Then let's sub things in. There again, sneak in, give us diameter. So R is actually 1.5 meters. We already talked about the no external torque. These we carry from before. Where for the cross product here, the V runs along this way and your R goes that way. So that when you take the cross product using your right hand rule, R cross V would give you a angular momentum that's out of the page, which would be counterclockwise, same as the merry-go-round itself. Notice that all along here, even if we look at this point, right, we're still going to take the perpendicular component of the radius. So the whole time, you're just going to get the magnitude of this cross product to be R times M times V equals similarly afterwards, we just sub in that final speed. You notice that we can actually factor out omega m2 here. And what we end up with is an mjr square term. Because you can also kind of understand the second part is you have a shape that's comprised of, again, the merry-go-round disk plus a point mass towards the edge. Right, which you will need to use the parallaxis theorem. And so that's why you take that mass, then you do delta r square. Okay, this is all consistent, right? You can either treat it as a point mass that's translating with respect to the center of mass, or you can treat it as part of a spinning object using the parallaxis theorem. In any case, let's just sub in a bunch of numbers. And calculate out term by term. Of course, angular momentum doesn't have pretty units. Summing and dividing through, we get that many reds per second, but we want revolutions per minute yet again. This time going backwards, but as long as we keep to our factor of one, it's pretty clear where we put the 60 and where we put the 2 pi, which is 22 RPM. Here they ask us angular velocity, so we do need not just the magnitude, but the direction as well. Everything was happening counterclockwise before. There's no reason not for it not to be counterclockwise, as shown that everything was positive and stayed positive. So just a final note that to reiterate, even though functionally we use this form, which separates out the angular rotation about its center from the translation of the center, fundamentally, this both of these terms actually comes from this integral here, which is the definition of angular momentum, most fundamentally. It's just that that looks substantially different from mv, right? mv, you would think, is i omega. And that's why I introduced that first part first. Here, we introduce the second half, and then referring to this integral, which is its definition, which you will never be expected to do yourself.